My name is Lisa Flaherty. I'm interviewing Linda Wilder Bryan for Georgia State University's Women's March Oral History Project. The date is the 15th of July and the interview is taking place at the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah. All right, so what year were you born? 1958. Okay. Oh, uh, where? In Savannah. In Savannah. Have you lived here all your life? All my life, until I went to Atlanta and went off to school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where'd you go to school? Mars Brown, one of the HBCUs. And so, um, what, was, uh, what was your life growing up here in Savannah? It was very family oriented. Mm -hmm. yeah. A father who uh, had 13 brothers and sisters, and they were from Statesboro, Georgia. My mother was from Savannah, and uh, they were Pentecostal, you know. Mm -hmm. But I raised my children Catholic, so I call myself Pentecostal Catholic. We either pray a short time or we pray a long time, but we were praying family. <laughs> Have uh, three brothers and one sister. I'm the middle child, so we're real, very close. And uh, my father uh, hunted. You know, he had like 21 dogs, and he bothered, and uh, he, the amazing thing about my father uh, was he was a mason, a brick mason, and he helped uh, where the Oglethorpe uh, benches downtown. Um, he contracted out for um, someone, but he helped lay the slab for that, and the historical canon that's downtown, him and his brothers made the shed and for the canon that sits right by the... Um, what is it? The um, excuse me, I'm lost for words. For city hall, really. And so uh, we're just a family. You know, mm -hmm. we did things together, went on trips together. And when it wasn't uh, really cool to go to Tybee, my father would take us there anyway. And we did church picnics, and uh, my mother churned butter, and you know, just old school family. Yeah. yeah. Now, is, uh, are there families from Georgia as well? Uh, your, your extended family? My your extended grandparents? family, my grand from Statesboro. Oh. Um, I actually did uh, my family's family reunion. They're actually from St. Mark's, um, South Carolina. And I was able to get my grandparents uh, on the census from 1840. Uh, yeah. There's two different spellings, and mm -hmm. you know, once you start doing stuff like that, you get really engrossed, and it took a lot of my time, and I was just going crazy. So I, I need to tell you a, a really funny story. There's a, a, a site called Afrogenesis, mm -hmm. and they do um, Afro-American um, uh, research, and so I was on there, and I, I just thought I was just doing an amazing thing for my parents, and so uh, uh, my grandmother's Great grandmother's listed as a mulatto, right? And so I was on the web and we were asking questions, and I was like, well, uh, <laughs> I was like, um, I was able to research my family, right? And I was like, and, and they were free, right? I went back and the man's like, um, Miss Linda, everybody was free in 1890. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> And so that was really funny to me because I I was just, you know, just the dates did not connect, you know, from 1865, right? So followed all, right, all the way to like uh, 1890s and 1910 and was able to, uh, it was just really interesting, right? It took a lot of time, but I learned that uh, the people who did the, the census back then weren't always uh, literate people. So two different spellings, but same families same uh, cooks and you know and so just it was just an amazing walk to know where you came from because a lot of people don't know yeah. where they came from and uh, where they come from and people don't value that so that was really valuable to my family when I was able to do that at a family reunion but yeah we're from Savannah mm -hmm. um, Clarendon County I don't even believe they call it Clarendon County anymore in South Carolina I think it's now Sumter but it's the same place. But yeah, most of, uh, I, like I said, my grandfather was a farmer, so that's what they did a long time ago. They raised really big families so that they could, uh, you know, take care of themselves. You know, and so they were bricklayers and plumbers and carpenters. And my mother was an upholstery seamstress, and so they were trade people. People who had trades, and that's important right now because. We don't have people that have trades. And in Savannah, we don't have a, a labor force that's 
workforce ready. And that's what we try to do right now, give people training so that they can uh, change the quality of their life. And you said that's what we try to do. Who's we? Uh, I lost a son in August of 2015. His name was Lawrence Bryan IV. IV. And so for two years, I've been fighting for living sons. Uh, and now I have an organization called L Before and After. We do partnerships with uh, the schools. And I've got programs, Chess No Mess, Raise Your Pants, uh, Raise Your Chance, a belt program. So any of the little hooks that we can get kids engaged. You know, I have a festival that made the front page news in Savannah. We do it at Forsyth Park on the anniversary of his demise. You know, I didn't want evil to win, so we pushed out love all three of the, ra the television stations. They, they captured that. And so that's how I met Coco Pappy, you know, from outreach in the community. And uh, bought CNN here. They did a story on um, crime here in Savannah. You know, it is just we got to do better and you know people blame parents and I, I I understand that there are some parents who don't care but there are some hard-working mothers in this community who just need just a little help and so I always say you know I like to use cliches so that people understand you have to have hooks and I always tell people if we don't let the village elders take care of our children the village idiots will and so that's what we fight. I have a partnership with uh, a lot of organizations here where we, like I said, fight for living sons, you know, to give them options and mentor them. And, and so doing that, I was able to meet Coco, who's a phenomenal young lady. And so uh, I was the bus captain. And that's how we got to um, the march. And it was very empowering, you know, and people said it was going to be about white women. And I was like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It was about gay rights and the Spanish rights and medical insurance and uh, educational rights. And so when I went there, uh, it was just so empowering, you know. It was so genuine, you know. People there, the spirit was of a sisterhood, you know. And uh, we had three buses and one didn't show up. And so uh, the second bus, I had the cool bus, and so we had a lot of fun, and on the way back, uh, I got people to write down the most impactful thing that happened to them while they were there. And so everybody wrote something down, and I put it in a, a little cup, and we shared it. And I mean, I tell you, the bus was crying, because everybody said, you know, I asked them what they went for and what they got out of going. You know, and so I told them to be just brutally honest. Don't put your name on it, you know, and have other people read it. And I said, a year from now, on this day, I believe it was the 21st, I want you to just hold it and look at it and see if anything changed in your life because that's what the movement was supposed to be about, change and renewal and making a difference in your corner of the world that you live in because we, we can't worry about what happens? We can worry about it, but in order to make a difference, we've got to make that difference where we live, and then it pushes out. And so, I'm just passionate about, you know, people, and once you live and you lose something that's very precious to you, your whole outlook changes. And so, you know, while I'm on Facebook, I've, I've given people hell here because I know they can do better, and my expectation is that I'm charged with doing that because there are 350 mothers in this community who have lost sons and they're walking around here and they didn't even have a cold case until I said not, no. And so now we have a cold case because uh, I fought for, you know, people who look like me and sound like me and who were charged of the city. You didn't want to have a cold case, so how do you say you care? about the quality of anybody's life, right, and, and not value young men who are dying. My son had a dream, you know, he wasn't an angel, but he had a dream and he came from a family that did things together, you know, and went on family trips and we ate together and a coward took that from us and, and not to call them out for what they are, I couldn't sleep at night. And so that's how we got CNN to come here and they uh, 
I met really nice people because I stayed up all night pushing sin and submit because I wanted to make a difference and my my um, whole purpose is to be that different, you know, and until my last gasp, I'm going to do good things in my son's memory. And part of that was to push out love. You can't let evil win. And so we have to embrace humanity. And so when I spell humanity, I spell it H-U-E because it's going to take all the shades and colors. You know, I tell people, Ms. Flattery, if we can't live together, we're going to continue to die together. And it can't be about color. It has to be about lives. And so, again, that's why I wanted to go because I, I wanted to be empowered to see all these women, millions of them, fighting for change. You know, Hispanics, Brown, Indians, you know, Muslims, just saying, we're tired. You're not our president. You, you, you don't stand for what we believe. And right now you're pushing out hate. And we're going to show what solidarity means. And that's what I got from going there. I had an awesome time. And I just can't wait until we have another anniversary so that we can do show people that he's not our president. He doesn't speak for us. On a glitch, he got elected. But that does not mean that he speaks for us. And so I, I speak for humanity, H-U-E-M-A-N-I-T-Y. I like that. It's the that's truth. fantastic. I will. I'm speechless actually <laughs> I, it's incredible what you've done um, um, to back up a little bit were your parents ever politically active my father was and my uncle was a bishop he didn't go but they supported him he actually went to the march on washington right. and so we, we 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 have a legacy of um of walking our talk you know that's what we were taught about um Nobody owes you anything, and so you can't make, make excuses for your lot in life. And they taught us that education was the edge of anything, you know. Um, I, I came from a working class. I didn't know that I was poor because my mother sewed, and my dad killed hogs, and we had cows. My dad uh, was known around his He bartered everything, you know. We even had a monkey, you know really a monkey and uh, a true story there was a man whose name was um, my dad had a mule his name was Kate because we had sugar canes and uh, butter beans and snap beans where we would sit on the porch you know when I was a little girl and did family stuff so and butter and biscuits and cured hams and so how do you know how do you think that you're poor when you have everything you know we had new clothes because my mom sold and she sold in the community and so um, there was Stalin Daring that buttresses where we live at. And so uh, when their cows would get out, my dad would bring them back in and we'd have milk and ice cream and that's what he did. And so uh, and he shared it with the kids in our neighborhood, right? And uh, he was just an amazing person. He was a giver. And so I, I taught my children to, to be givers too, you know, and to be kind. And, uh, to look people in their eyes when they spoke, you know? And that's what was taught to me. And I realized from working in the community, um, people think that there are mothers who understand that, but there are mothers in this community who are mothers when they're 10 years old and 12 years old. And how do you teach them something that you don't know? And so when I speak in front of people, I'm like, you know, there are two sides, you know? and there's cycles. You have grandmothers who are 25 years old. I didn't have my first child until I was 30, you know. But people want to blame parents and mothers, and it's easy to do that. But we've got to embrace the whole wheel and those different cogs in the wheel. And all of them mean something. And when cogs in a wheel are broken, that wheel doesn't move. And so what my foundation tries to do is keep that wheel greased and moving. You know, we're not trying to invent the wheel. We're just trying to make sure that we give kids options and uh, opportunities and programs so that they know that they get other things. When we had teachers, our teachers attended the same churches that we went to, you know. So now um, parents go to school and I tried to mediate for some of those parents, but then there are a lot of ignorant people. There are a lot of people 
Um, and ignorance does not mean, and when I say that, I'm saying the lack of not knowing, you know. And so we can't fault children for parents who don't know that they don't know. You know, they don't know about nutrition, and they don't know about uh, sitting down and telling their kids you can't do that. Because nobody never told them. And so when we know better, we do better. And so I tried to get a hundred mothers together from all walks of lives. You know, um, just mothers who are doctors and attorneys and teachers. Because I figured, you know, if you want to change children's lives, you got to change their mothers. And if we could get a hundred mothers uh, who were doing things in the community, just normal mothers, you know, they didn't have to be rich, you know, but mothers who know about cooking and nutrition and washing clothes, you know, then we can impact thousands of children if one mother had four, you know, and so we, we've got to help the overwhelmed mothers and, and I, I wanted to go to D.C. to hear other stories of people and how they came on the other side of horrific experiences that led them to do better. You know, people have said all kind of things about me in this community and about me being a mad, angry black woman and I have a right to be mad. Something was taken from me that nobody can give back. If somebody stole your pocketbook, you would be mad. You know, somebody steals a car, you would be mad. Somebody, my son was not lost, he was stolen. You know, somebody took that from me and, and I've tried to you know, just put my life out there so that they can see that you're not going to kill him twice. He came from a family that loved him, that went to church, you know, that embraced everything, extracurricular activities, you know, just, I knew his friends, you know, and I knew his friends' parents, right? And my son uh, was in a gambling house. He did, and I, I told everybody that you, you can't, you can't use something against me that I'm telling you that it happens. And so he was 23. And uh, when you have a child or when you raise children, you do all that you can when they're young. And you hope when they go out, they make good choices. He put himself at risk, but who doesn't? You know, and so I was an awesome parent, you know, and he knew love, you know, and so. We wanted to share that with the city. You know, the day that he got killed, I got up and got my family, about 40 of us, and we stood on City Hall. And I'm like, you're not going to kill him twice. You know, the first bullets were, you're not going to defame his character. You're not going to say that he was not worthy of justice. And so I wanted to be a voice, and that's how I got into politics. I ran two months in. Uh, for a post at large from, against an incumbent and got 11,000 votes in two months because I, I tell you I was just not going to let my son's death be in vain and everything that I do now is because of love you know and when love is pure and uncensored it's unconditional you know and nobody has a right to take anybody's life and then walk free and the community says um, business as usual and so again all that I can say or do is that I just can't give up you know we got to keep pushing and I try to engage as many people and as I can and it doesn't matter I just won't fighting mothers because because mothers are going to change what's going on in this world and again, that was one of the reasons why um, going to Washington was so personally important to me. It was just so empowered. I'm like, how do people fight and keep fighting and not stop? And so that's what the movement was. So um, when did you find out that the march was going to take place? Um, it was on Facebook. I mean, right when it happened, I was like, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way to get there. And so Coco was like, okay, we need team captains. I was like, I'll do it. You know, I'll, you know, and so. Um, Did you know what a team captain would have to do? Yeah. You know, I was on the uh, email where they pushed out information, how we 
We're trying to get women from all walks of life. And we had a, a pretty diverse group of women on our bus, and that, that's what made it so awesome, you know. And I, I'm a talker. I guess you see that now. So I had a captured audience. I was like, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and they liked it. <laughs> so, and so we had fun, and we had a really great time. And so when we went to Trinity, you know, um, um, Trinity, the church, okay. uh, Coco got everybody to bring the signs that they carried. And everybody like this, we got to get up into a church around the square, and we all told our stories. And so when I got up, I was like, what bus were you on? And everybody said, the cool bus, right? So we made a difference, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I like to think that um, I made some friends for life, people in the community who were trying to make a difference. Um. So tell me about the people on the bus. Just you said it, it was a diverse group. Can yeah, you give me more yeah. information about yeah. that? Yeah, we, we had teachers, we had um, psychologists, we had uh, two mothers that I worked with, um, with MAD, Moms Demand in Action, um, Lindsay Donovan and Ann Westbrook, and we had Joanne Morton, uh, and we had Leslie Messenger, who's, when I think about Leslie, she lost a son. She actually got 911, the Good Samaritan Act, approved here in Georgia. And it has to do with uh, the drug uh, that they give people to sustain life. You know how people used to be charged if they were somewhere and somebody overdosed and they left people to die? Now you can call 911 and not worry. So Leslie Messenger was on the bus with us. And so just a lot of people. Um, uh, uh, from this community uh, who were working to uh, Brenda Johnson, she's another mother who lost a son in this community. And so we had mothers who, who just wanted to be a part of a movement that, that embraced love and that's what that movement did and it didn't matter, you know, which background you came from. We were all there as a show for solidarity and unity and and our bus nobody slept, you know, because everybody was excited and talking and and uh, just took pictures and photobombed each other and I bought food and gave out games and we just had a really great I mean, I don't even know that they knew that it was more than twelve hours to get there, you know. And so we we, we got what we wanted plus some added stuff, you know, you know, we got to hear people talk about their walk and how they got to where they were and it was an opportunity for people to walk in other people's shoes and that was just really impactful for people to understand. Um, we all had lobotomies, you know, we got to open up your head and just let anything come out and I think it made us better people. Do you think that happens very often? No, I don't think so. Okay. And, and that's why uh, racism is still here. Because when you have those initial conversations, people get pissed. But when you're on a bus, you got to hear it. <laughs> you know, when you have a captive audience, and, and it gives uh, people a time to reflect and look at it like, hmm, I didn't think about it that way. And so, if we want to move towards a world where we say we want people to do better, we have to be better listeners, and we have to be better communicators, and we have to move beyond what's in our little box, you know? And when we step out of that box, we, we get to see a life um, that can happen, you know? You know, it doesn't have to be a, a dream, it's something that's doable if we don't shut down time we hear something that we don't agree with. And you know, people tell you all the time, it's okay to disagree, and they don't mean it. You know, that's just words. But when you embrace that idea, then you see real change. And real change is not going to come until we stop being better listeners and better thinkers and, and, and people who walk their talk. You know, we have a lot of people who say things and, you know, they don't really mean it because it takes too much work, you know. But I can tell you one thing that I've learned. It does not take a whole bunch of work to love. It doesn't. 
And people just need encouragement. That's part of love. People need to know that, that, that there are people who care. And it doesn't matter um, what your, 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 your income is, you know? Real conversations. Yeah. Just really conversations. You know, you have to be brutally honest to move beyond where we are now. And it's not going to happen unless we have captive audiences, you know? And so people laughed at me. And I was like, when I spoke in front of Trinity, I'm like, everybody knows I'm a talker. And the best thing that I like is having a captive audience. Well, you got to listen to me. <laughs> and you got to hear. And I got to listen to other people. And so that's what happened on our trip. We, we listened. I mean, we really listened to what people's ideas were and where they came from and, and what it means to be a mother and what it means to be a woman in 2017, you know. Right now, it's very easy to, um, to push people aside as numbers, but when you come face to face with them, it's a very different story. Yes, it's a different story. It's very different. All right, so um, now... Um, some logistics about the boring stuff, but interesting stuff mm -hmm. about how to got how you got your bus together. So emails were going out. How did you even get in touch with the people that you brought on your bus? Facebook blast. All right, every day I, I count it down. You want to be a part of her story. We call I called it her story. Mm -hmm. You know, what were these men are saying? Go up there and see for yourself what other women are doing. And I raised hell. I said, listen. How do we not fool ten buses? You know, how do how do people in this community say that they 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 want to make a difference and you don't even want to pay ninety dollars for a round trip ticket? Now, when we first started out, it was like two hundred, but the more people got on the bus, and so on the end, it was like eighty dollars. I mean, how do you not spend eighty dollars for something that that made a huge statement around the world? You know, and to come from Chatham County and not want to be involved, oh, I was like, you don't want to go? Okay, this person will go, and when one person, I was like, tag a friend, tell somebody, you know, show your badge, and you know what, I meant to bring um, you a, I bought the little, um, what do you call it, lanyards, it said 2017, that I marched, you know, and so I bought them back, I spent, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, because I got this guy, and he gave me about 50 of them for like, $30 and he was selling for $10 and it may have been about 60 and so I gave them to people who weren't able to go and so when I came back I gave them to my friends and I was like listen you're still a part of it you made history put it somewhere right and so uh, we just tried to engage people from um, that Emily Eisenhardt um, she I think Emily's a college professor she donated and I'm like listen if you can't go how about you send somebody who really wants to go. And so we got people to donate seats, you know. We got uh, people to uh, send us off when we left. And so the news came and they told our stories and uh, one bus didn't show up. And we had people actually crying because they couldn't go. Well, what, what did you do? Uh, what did those people do? Most of them, I guess, didn't go or they, they didn't, didn't go. They didn't and, go. And some of them got in cars, you mm -hmm. know, and they carpooled. And, you know, it was just an awesome um, camaraderie. We sang songs and told stories, and we, we talked to people who were uh, over 50. You know, we kind of say, you know, and meant it. You know, the white, the uh, black cliche is, I have white friends, and I have black friends, and we was like, oh no, this is my friend, because uh, from the fifth grade, I, I can go further than that. You know, I don't have, you know, I've had friends, you know, for a long time, and so it was just really interesting, you know, some people didn't have friends, and some people grew up in backgrounds where they did not have uh, communications with, with, with black people, you know, um, but for the most part, um, it was very endearing, you know, people just embracing sisterhood and it not meaning anything about color and just for in that moment in time it was not about color and so I'm under the belief that we can do that again you know and we can keep it going you know we, there are naysayers and there are people who don't believe but all the time you know there been the minority that made the difference so that the majority can embrace it and so you just got to keep pushing out positive things, you know, and not worrying about, you know, the negative things, you know. So that's what we do.
you know, we just keep fighting for humanity and making a difference. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, um, you mentioned, well, maybe we'll put that off for a minute. So everyone had some signs. Um, I saw another one of these signs earlier today. Can you tell me about these? These are pretty incredible. Scott, oh my God, I have to show you. Uh, Scott Stanton, Pan Am Slim, is this uh, white guy that you would not even know that he was white until you miss him because he and his wife and his two kids are just so full of love. Scott has gone all around Savannah making these posters and pictures of wonderful sayings uh, from the Beatles and uh, just everybody, you know, Martin Luther King and uh, Pink and anybody who said anything that's quotable that meant something to people to make them change, he did it. And so I met him at a vigil and he's like, are you Linda Wilder Bride? I'm like, yeah. He said, I'm Scott Stan. I'm like, get out of here. I thought he was a black guy. You know, I really did because he has all uh, uh, James Brown classic stuff and uh, like I said, he he is just, you know, there are people that you meet that you know are, are wonderful and different and when you meet them you have to embrace them because you know they're different mm -hmm. and he is really different. And so on Facebook after I met him, uh, I had, uh, I said, black lives should matter when they're in the womb and not when they enter the tomb. And so he did a picture of it for me. Yeah, this, you know, and uh, made it and brought it to me. I took pictures of it with my grandson. I'll, I'll show it to you right now. I have it and uh, I'm never going to ever uh, um, forget how touching that was that he actually saw some value in little old me, you know, and uh, he was willing to take time out to share that with um, so many people in Savannah, you know, I've got like 5,000 people on Facebook in one group and 3,200 in the other and just for him to show that kind of sincerity, you know, a mother's pain, it just really touched me. And so every time he does something, I'm like, oh yeah, y'all y'all got to follow Scott. And so I buy his pictures and this, this one right here was very important to me. Can you pull it out? Yeah. There we go. Oh, we can see it now. Perfect. Yeah. So she actually, um, Dorothy Height, I'm in a public service sorority, uh -huh. Delta Sigma Theta, and she is a a Delta, you know. Oh, she, wow. Yeah, she was over the Department of Education at one time, um, appointed. I think it was during the, I don't want to get it wrong, Kennedy? But she worked with um, Mary McLeod Thune, and um, who's also a Delta and uh, Roosevelt, Miss Roosevelt, mm -hmm. you know, she was a big believer in black education. And so that's what I meant when I say the edge in education because it doesn't matter where you come from, it's where you're going. And education gets you there. And so we got to get our kids uh, cranked up and engaged and loving to learn again, and hooks and whatever it's going to take to uh, make them productive citizens and giving back in our community. And so that's my charge now. Um, so you're on the bus, you have all these incredible people surrounding you. What were your expectations when you arrived in D.C.? To get more of that, to just get more of that, you know, to be empowered by, by people who were assertive and aggressive and sure of themselves and, and, and saying, not my president. And, you know, and, and saying, we're not going to embrace uh, hate, you know, we're not going to embrace um, um, ineptness and, and mediocrity. We want the best. This is supposed to be the best country, and that's our expectation. And 
God damn it, excuse me, that's what we want. And so we had a lot of little old ladies cursing, and I was like, wow, <laughs> they were raising hell, honey. I was like, yeah, I like that. <laughs> this is going to be a good march, you know. And so, you know, <clears throat> it was just powerful, you know. It was just, and people were so nice, you know. People were just so nice. And I was like, wow, if I could bottle this and sell this. And so I'm like, that's what we need all the time. Little marches, you know, little, everybody has to have their little sign that they carry, you know. And that's what I, it was in my head when people marched. I was like, wow, just Scott, you know, we were walking around and people was like, because we were all the way everywhere. There were people who didn't even uh, ride the bus, right? But Scott made, Scott made signs for everybody who went. Everybody. You, it was just, I, when I tell you this guy is awesome, you have to Google him, you know? He made signs and you, uh, from Mae West. I mean, everybody, you know, from Jack Manassas, from Coretta Scott King. I mean, just women, you know, uh, Bobby Dylan, um, um, just, just, it was just awesome. And so, uh, because we had this sign, some lady from the Smithsonian saw it. And so he has a, um, some pictures that are supposed to be in the Smithsonian about this. And so it was like, you know, hollering and screaming, yeah, Scott, you know, he's from Chatham County. And so we need to be cheerleaders for each other. And, and that's what I got out of that march, people being cheerleaders, and I was thinking um, on the way back, everybody had these just wonderful, thought-provoking, beautiful, out-of-the-box signs, and I was like, I wonder what would happen if each of us carried signs, you know, just everywhere you go, you had a sign, you know, that you were a walking sign, and I was like, well, maybe you don't have to carry a sign, but you could be a walking poster for humanity. There's so many causes, and I tell people, pick one. You know, just pick a cause. You know, there's so many social injustices that children face, the elderly face, you know, gays face, you know, um, the homelessness, veterans, just so many things that people can do to make it better and change the quality of life for people. And so I tell people, you know, be a sign, be a poster, you know, and then watch real change. And so, yeah, I get it. And so, we try to galvanize other people to get the same thing. And sometimes we win, and sometimes, you know, it's not always pleasant, but, you know, you stay focused, and you stay prayed up, and, and you know that a better day is coming. Because it has to be, you know. It's just like somebody on drug, and that's what I, the scenario for me is like, this country has to bottom out completely to start all over again, you know, and, and we have to have a metamorphosis, and I think that's what's happening, and I think this movement um, proved that, that, you know, we're like uh, butterflies, you know, teaching each other how to have light and brilliant colors to make a difference in everybody's world, and again, you know, it was just a trip that I can tell my grandchildren that I was a part of and and, and, and you know people walking around and saying uh, I'm a pussy it's just I was crazy I was like oh really <laughs> I'm like oh, okay <laughs> yeah it was just amazing you know so what were the responses to your sign and what signs did you uh, that that struck you yeah um, um, there was one sign you know there were so many there was this lady had a sign and she said, when I die, I, I'm, let me see, let me get it together. I'm a woman now, I'm a woman forever, and when I die and come back, I'm still going to be a damn woman, a damn fighting woman. And so uh, that was, that, that, that people were, were proud of who they were, you know, whether they were gay or black or Hispanic or Jewish or Muslims, people were proud of who they were and for the most part, um, all the signs were people who were proud of who they are and if you don't like yourself then it's hard to not like other people. We've got to like ourselves and there are people who struggle with liking themselves and um, I was just really proud to be um, there because there were no fights, 
you know, people were walking together and laughing and, hey, where you from and who did that? It was just awesome, you know, and so all the sides, I just can't picture one before, they were all just um, people who knew the direction that this country has to go in if we're going to say we're the greatest country in the world and really mean it. So what were the reactions to your sign? Um, I got this sign um, after I got back. Oh. I, the sign that I took was, it was a paper one, but I wanted to bring this one because it's, it, it, it's, it, it's my story. You know? It's my story that we're, we're, we're not a people, a problem people, we just a people with problems. And you don't have to be black to have problems, right? The sign that I carried was Martin Luther King's, um, one of his noted words that, you know, an injustice to one person is an injustice to everybody. And that's the one that I took, right? And um, how true is that? You know, and so if we allow things to happen to people just because we don't look like them or sound like them, how right is that? It's still an injustice. And we have to have people with big hearts, you know, and big heads to absorb all the things that we needed to to make it better and the quality of life change. So, um, what did your family think of you going up there? Oh, my mom's 85 years old and she was just, go, go. She encourages everything that I do. I took my sister and my niece, you know, um, and my sister, my niece, and her daughter, who was a student at Savannah State, so they took pictures because that was three generations, right? My daughters, they lived in Atlanta, and so they couldn't go, and so we, we it was a family outing, you know. I had, like I said, my sister, her daughter, and her daughter. They made history, you know, in their family unit, and so they had a great time, and we walked, and um, the community that we walked through from, I think it was um, John F. Kennedy Stadium. We, that's where the bus are, you know, some people took shuttles and we wanted to see, um, and so we walked. And along, along the parade route, um, some wonderful person in the community, right, a, a really nice community, uh, she bought signs for everybody, you know, and put them in their yards and they were saying from everybody, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Martin Luther King, about unity and change and what the forefathers said, right? And they were all uh, lined up and you, get, you got to read them. And they were outside giving out bottled water and saying thank you for coming. And it was really nice, you know, the whole city embraced us, you know? And it was like, well, we didn't get this for the inauguration, you know, because he did. You know, he tried to claim that we were there for him. Uh, fake news. <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing to see people in D.C. say, come on, come on. And the churches opened their doors and gave out water and went to a um, Seventh-day Advantage church. You know, I have pictures of that. And again, I was talking and uh, met uh, some people who knew my girlfriend, who is a captain. Um, in the military, but she's a dentist too now, and she um, has uh, two, and we were talking, and their community is a close one, you know, they have a school in Huntsville where most of the seven advantage uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, they send their children there, you know, it's a community-based um, uh, undergraduate school, and they knew her, you know, and so I was like, wow, and my sister's like, you can't go anywhere without knowing anybody. I was like, <laughs> and so I like um, Monk, and I don't know if you know about Monk. Uh, he is a detective, right? And he is, and so, I, you know, my friends always laugh when I say that. I'm like, uh, what, what's this thing he said? It's a, it, what is, how did he say it? It's a, a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. You know, just a lot of fun, you know. Um, it was amazing. Just amazing. And, um, Excuse me. Oh, fine. You said on the way back, um, every, you had collected statements from yeah. everyone. You don't happen to have those statements, do you? No. 
I told them to keep the statements. They read them all out loud. Yeah. And the whole idea was a year from now, you know, open it up and see if you're still talking to some of the people that you took emails from. And if the statement that you wrote, you got to pick somebody else's and they would raise their hand and say, I want that one. And they didn't have to know who said it, right? But you have to honor it. I'm like, just don't take it. Get a statement that somebody on the bus said that you really want to make a change in your life. And on the anniversary, you know, see if it changed your life and if you actually acted on that. And so no, I, I don't have it, but I, I wanted it, I wanted our bus to be have a lasting memory, you know, something that they could reach back and say, oh yeah, I remember that. And so that's why I mean, when I said what bus were we, and everybody said the cool bus, you know, it was really great. It was, and so Coco did a phenomenal job, you know. She's a little warrior, you know. I call her a warrior princess, and. We had a lot of people who didn't go that said, okay, maybe I'll give $20. And I'm like, it didn't matter, you know, to get one person to go. And so we had a lot of women who gave $5, you know. You know, one lady, you know, it was just awesome, you know, buy your soda when you get there, you know. And so that's what the sisterhood is. It's like a marriage. It's a partnership, you know. Sometimes it's 70-30. Sometimes it's 60-40. Uh, sometimes it's 50-50. But women need to know that there are people um, who believe, you know, and who are willing to pick up that banner for you to get things done. Let me see. Um, um, did you get to hear any of the speakers? Mm -hmm. We got to hear it. And you know, um, we were so, there were so many people, they kind of like rerouted people. And so a lot of the stores and the shopping areas, they had this big, huge, um, in one of the malls, um, I'll show you a picture, they had a big Megatron where you can see the speakers. And so we, we, we got to hear um, Ms. Waters and uh, a lot of people speak because we stopped. We're like, uh, we can't get through there. Let's just stay where we are. And so there were pockets. And I, again, had a captive audience. You, I uh, read to people in the area that I was, and I'll show it to you, uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And people listened, and, and I was like, here we are again, doing the same thing 60, 50 years later, and we're no further. People are still fighting for peace and poverty and jobs. You know, what really changed? You know, so we're playing musical chairs, and that's where the metamorphosis, you know. I'm like, we don't want to wait a hundred years, you know, we shouldn't have to wait. You know, they tell us history repeats itself every hundred years. I'm like, are y'all willing to wait a hundred years, you know, so that you can see change? And so my sister laughed at me, and we couldn't move. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start reading Martin Luther King said I inserted women and stuff in it. So it was really awesome. And so yeah. Those are the kind of things that I do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, did you come into contact with um, any counter demonstrations or um, anything? Mm -hmm. um, what did you think of the media's coverage after the march? I, th I think the media's coverage, they kind of minimized it. And because, listen, that's why it wasn't that, this is my perspective, you know. When we had the presidential election, and I don't mean to offend you, but white men feel, I think they feel like they're losing power. And so you have a black male president and hell no we're not going to have a white woman and so everybody who could vote I know they dragged them there to vote because they were not going to have uh, Hillary Clinton you know so they did everything possible would I have voted for Bernie Sanders hey 
Would I have voted for Bernie Sanders? Yeah. You know, I, do I think he would have had a, a better opportunity? You know, because of hindsight, yeah. But uh, from day one, you know, everybody woke up like the Dewey Truman. You know, so it wasn't so much that she was a female. It was that they did not and could not have another minority be in the President of the United States. And that scared them. It petrified them. And so hate won that time, but hate's not going to win. We can't let hate win. And so all of our expectations, you know, you know, I, I did law enforcement and we say you eat, it's either flight or fight. You know, and so now people are choosing to fight, you know, and so that's the only way that love and peace and justice is going to win if we fight for what's real, you know, and truth takes longer, but it always prevails, and that's what we're counting on, our real truth, what America is about, a melting pot of uh, people moving in the same direction for change. And women are going to make that happen. And to hear all those women who are in Congress who are saying that they're going to fight to make sure that our voices are heard was just phenomenal for me. You know? um, um, the bus ride back, what, uh, what can you tell me about the bus ride back and the emotions? Surreal. You know, it was like, you know, it was like we went to a war, you know, when we came back and we won. You know, we all had 52 different stories that made each of us, this puzzle, stronger for Chatham County. You know, it was like mentally exhausting, you know, it was like, are we going to keep carrying this torch or does it end with this bus ride? And that was the whole thing about writing those little, getting people to write, you know. Are, are you going to keep moving forward or, it, or, or it's just a, a phase for you that, that you say, I went and I experienced? Or are you going to really try to make a difference, you know? Or, are you going to be that banner? Or, are you going to have a uh, a cause that's important to you because there were several. You know, it just wasn't one thing. It was about humanity. And the bus ride back, you know, I just got fooled because it doesn't matter uh, how I got into this. And I got into this just because I lost something, you know. And again, um, I just don't see how people want to embrace change if they're not doing anything to change, you know, to be receptive and, and acceptive, and accepting of uh, what it's going to take to just, you know, I don't know, it just... Are there hard questions to yeah, answer? Yeah. Well, do you think in the, t in the time between the march and now, um, what what do you think? Do you, do you think your expectations and your and your hopes? Yeah, how are you? I'm, I'm in a pants nation, and people are still fighting. They they still have that fire, you know. Mm -hmm. They're still carrying torches, and and for some people, it's real. You know, this thing called life is real, and and they're not willing to stop. And you know, they got people. What do we do? You know, you know, uh, we don't want it to stop here. You know, it was just awesome. And people just wanted that awesome to last as long as it could, you know. Yeah. And so you, what do you do? You just keep fighting, you know, until, like, you get that momentum, you know, and you get people who believe, and you work with the people who believe, you know, until um, it's believable, mm -hmm. you know, and it's attainable, and it's doable, and and people see that. It's going to get better. Yeah. Okay, my last question. You were talking about an event at Trinity Church. Can oh, you yeah, tell awesome. me a little bit about that? Yeah, that's Coco Pappy again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
she got together, even the people who um, didn't, didn't get a chance to go, right? But everybody who was on bus one and bus two, they, they got to get up and tell the stories and what it meant to uh, be on the bus and be a part of the march from the inception to the return. You know, and everybody who had a sign, they bought the signs with them, and you got to go up and tell your story and what it meant, much like this right here. And people who didn't go, they they got a chance to to step back in time with us to actually we we tried to make it that they could visualize what the atmosphere was and that it wasn't fake and that it was real, and that people walk their talk, and that they really were fed up. You know, I'm telling you, little old ladies, I mean, just, <laughs> it was just, I mean, black, white, you know, just, you know, people in their uh, ethnic garbs, you know, you know, Indians, you know, and somebody said something about that. I was like, that's the craziest thing, you know, on Facebook, that Indian women, Native Indian women were offended because people took their picture. I'm like, I can't, you know, I, it's just crazy, you know. And so, yeah, you know, Muslim women, you know, it was just awesome. And so we made her story. And did that take place like right after you came back or a week later? Or yeah, I think it was about a, a week later. Maybe it was less than two weeks. Um, so it was still fresh, and you know they had a, a march here, and they were invited, and it was just awesome. You know, the church was full, full, full. It's one of the big churches around the square. Yeah. You know, so it was awesome. That is so cool. Well, that's all the questions I have. Have I? Is there anything that you can think of that I've forgotten, or any events or moments that yeah. that stick out? Mm -hmm. You are. Amazing. I am so honored to listen to what you have to say. I know you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I was like,